Uh, and um, it's, now it is really a great uh, pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker and uh, and my boss, uh, <laughs> Bill Graham. And um, uh, the reason he's not emceeing this luncheon, as he usually does, is we wanted him to save his voice for his remarks. And um, uh, we really are so thrilled that we get to hear him um, talking today a little bit about what you foresee for the study of religion in the 21st century. So, Bill, uh, I know everybody's very eager to hear your comments, so please come back up. Thank you. Well, I've always said that deaning is being without being content free. Um, I'm going to try to put a little bit of content into some remarks to you today. Um, why study religion in the 21st century? Now, I cannot claim that the title announced for this talk was my idea. Uh, but when my colleagues planning today's program put it to me as a question, after a lot of hesitation and a moment of weakness, I did finally agree to try and tackle it, massive as it is in a little over 20 minutes. What this acquiescence says about either my sanity or my uh, hubris is not encouraging, but here goes. I'll try to stay with my text so that I can get through in the time allotted, uh, because it is a lot to try to tackle. While I cannot provide a single simple answer to this question that is satisfactory, I think it's an important one for anyone, not only those who care about Harvard Divinity School's educational mission, to want to answer. I realize it is now, I'm sometimes with a bit of shock, that it's now nearly a half century that I have been studying, teaching, and writing about the history of religion. I myself stumbled out of European history, languages, and literature into the history of religion here at Harvard in the mid-1960s because I was stymied in trying to do comparative history among the historians. They didn't believe that was legitimate at that time. I shifted into comparative religion where people did think comparative history was quite possible. I did so largely because I saw religion then, even not having studied it before, as I do now, as a central force in world history, both for good and for evil. In that regard, I'm reminded of my mentor Wilfred Smith's dictum, religion has not been a good thing, but it has been a great thing. And I think that's a fairly fair statement uh, about world history. Religion is a key element in every culture and in every phase of history, and I have stayed with its study all these years because I do believe that there is reason to study religion today, just as there will be, if anything, even greater reason to do so in the century ahead of us. Indeed, much of my work as dean here at HDS has been directed at building a faculty and programs that can offer models for how to study religion in the decades ahead uh, of us. In considering the question as to why religion needs to be studied in the 21st century, I've reflected largely upon the broader societal good that such study might offer and less upon what advances in knowledge and understanding might be achieved within the scholarly community uh, that makes religious and theological studies its professional province. Certainly, the advancement of knowledge and understanding is what my colleagues and I aim at in our work as scholars, and it's not unimportant. I would be far from saying that. But it is the work of generations and centuries, and not work that always bears immediate fruit for current problems and concerns in the world at large. In the half century of my academic life, the sophistication and depth of study, analysis, and interpretation of religion, both as a generic dimension of human existence and also in the specificity of the myriad religious communities and traditions around the world, has advanced with almost breathtaking explosiveness. In America alone, but also worldwide, the study of religion has achieved a visible and accepted place in higher education that was frankly almost unimaginable as late as the early 1960s. It's also worth noting, I think, that my career corresponds almost exactly to the life of the largest professional association for religious studies in North America, the American Academy of Religion, which was the new name given to the National Association of Biblical Instructors in 1964. That was an organization that had been around for 40 or 50 years itself. The new name signaled the, sh signaled the shift from largely Christian, preeminently biblical studies to a more expansive attempt to deal with religion as a global phenomenon. 
That shift has gone on apace ever since. And today, HDS, along with the University of Chicago and the Divinity School there, reflects this perhaps more than any other divinity school. The study of religion as a field of humanistic and social scientific endeavor has flourished, and it has now become important to not only liberal arts but divinity studies as well. Despite that, I cannot see that it has changed the wider world in discernible ways that we might wish it had done. Even if it has made more modest contributions to much better awareness of our shared, highly pluralistic world of religious communities and persons. And even if one disputes this last state statement about the degree to which we've had a lot of influence with our studies, I still want to focus not on the contributions of religious studies to learning, but instead on the constantly increasing need for such studies to contribute to the public, not just the academic global world of contemporary life and practice. It is demonstrably, demonstrably the case today that social and individual life around the world is inextricably tied up with religious issues, with religious thinking and with religious action. And these thus deserve our attention and analysis beyond whatever academic and hermeneutic interests we may pursue in our scholarship. Even if the famous clash of civilizations thesis of my late colleague Sam Huntington is wrong, as I indeed think it is, the importance of religious and cultural differences in our world is not going to diminish anytime soon. I think that we can all agree on. Consequently, my fundamental response to the question, why study religion in the 21st century, is just this. Because religion, whether an agent of stability or instability, of progress or retrogression, of peace or conflict, or simply of diverse kinds of change everywhere in the world, will long continue to be a critical factor in individual social and political life around the world, and we need to understand it. We can easily recognize that religion has begun in recent years to receive ever more attention in public media and governmental policy circles around the globe, not always for the right reasons. The post-enlightenment certainty that reason would replace religion proved wildly off the mark. Yet still, religion remains one of the least well understood sectors of life there is for the majority of persons in any and every society today. Of course, everyone thinks he or she understands religion, or at least his or her own variety of it, but there is much evidence to indicate this is not actually so. <laughs> Take the American case, for example. In the well-publicized Pew Religious Knowledge Survey of 2010, atheists and agnostics scored highest, with Jews and Mormons close second and third among all Americans in their ability to answer really basic questions about the core teachings, histories, and leading figures of major world religious traditions. And these results were after controlling for different levels of education. And while these three groups, that is the atheists, uh, the um, agnostics, and Jews and Mormons somehow were looped, lumped together here, um, <laughs> as uh, oppressed, oppressed minorities, I guess. So, um, in any case, while these groups averaged only between 20 and 21 correct answers to the 32 simple questions on the survey, all other groups averaged only between 11.6 and 17.6 correct answers, or an average well uh, less than half the possible correct answers to the survey questions. There are probably a number of conclusions one could plausibly draw from these results, but the overall picture is one of relative ignorance in our society about the faith of other persons. Only 47% of Americans know that the Dalai Lama is Buddhist. Only 38% can ad identify Shiva and Vishnu uh, as associated with Hindu traditions. And only about 27% know that the largest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia, has a Muslim majority in its population. In fact, when you look at the more specific findings of the survey, societal ignorance about uh, Americans' own religious traditions looms even larger than that about foreign traditions. 53% of American Protestants could not identify Martin Luther as the main figure inspiring the Protestant Reformation. 45% of Catholics did not know that their church holds to transubstantiation of the communion bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. 
Only 43% of Jews recognize that Maimonides, one of the greatest figures of Jewish learning and faith, was actually Jewish. <laughs> I could go on, but I think the gist is clear and pretty discouraging. If knowledge about religion, our own and others, is important, we could surely use a better informed public where religious matters are concerned. Why? Well, that again is asking why study religion in the 21st century. At the same time, uh, as I've cited the Pew report, according to the very interesting recent study, American Grace, co-authored by my colleague here at Harvard, Robert Putnam, with David Campbell of Notre Dame, it appears counterintuitively that despite their general ignorance about religion, Americans, especially younger Americans, thank heaven, are today becoming much more accepting of persons of other faiths than ever before. If Putnam and Campbell are right, religious tolerance for one's fellows belonging to multiple faith traditions is increasing even if knowledge about these traditions is rudimentary or non-existent. This is not a case of ignorance is bliss. Rather, Putnam and Campbell attribute this to the simple fact that many more Americans today than ever before have increasing personal experience of colleagues, friends, and even family members who differ from them, often radically so, in their religious faith. This tallies with the indications of the continuing growth of a truly religiously plural American society that our colleague Diana X Pluralism Project has been documenting for years now. Even if there is increasing tolerance for persons of other faiths, such as Putnam and Campbell argue for, the Pew study and any glance at our national media coverage of anything religious tell us there is still a very high level of incomprehension and ignorance about religion generally and religious commitments and practices other than our own in particular, not to mention a frightening sector of our population that harbors an intense conviction that only their own religious tradition is valid or true. So we still desperately need instruction at all levels of our educational system that teaches future citizens about religion as a global and human, not a sectarian and parochial reality. <coughs> and by religion here, I mean the myriad ways in which human beings around the globe, across the centuries, have dealt with the meaning of life and the values by which to order one's personal life, one's family life, one's social organization, and one's dealing with other human beings, both within and outside of one's own particular religious, national, racial, ethnic, linguistic, or socioeconomic group. Why do we need more instruction? The answers are fairly simple but very crucial. Four of them come to mind that I would point to. First, we need policymakers and politicians who have some grasp of the actual religious dimensions of life in other nations and cultures so that they do not proceed ignorantly to assume and act on popular and mistaken generalizations about what all Hindus or every Jew or most Muslims believe or do. Second, we need persons in the professions, in trades, in homes, in every walk of life who have some grasp of the fact that their own value systems are not unique, nor uniquely valid or good, nor uniquely applicable to everyone else in the world. Third, we need Americans of good intention in all walks of life to know enough about the varied religious communities around the corner as well as around the world to understand the poverty and danger of speech that refers simplistically to jihad or polytheism or legalism or things other people live by and for. Fourth and finally, we need Americans of all kinds to know enough to uh, accept and if possible to understand intelligently and to feel viscerally that millions of other human beings, be they monotheist, polytheist, humanist, atheist, or whatever, Millions just as human as they are, are at least as moral, at least as intelligent, and at least as faithful to their own lights, their own traditions and values, as they are to theirs. Even persons of good intentions and expansive tolerance still need to know much more about the religious motivations and values of their neighbors at home and abroad. And militant Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and others need to recognize that the energy spent trying to convert others to their religious points of view or confessions, much less killing the other, which also too often happens, could better be spent 
proving by thoughts, words, and actions that their own religious code is authentic, productive, and a blessing rather than a curse on humankind. And here I'm reminded of Lessing's great story of Nathan the Wise, which I, if I had time today, I would retell to you, but look it up if you would, uh, uh, because it is a great story about what one should do with one's religious faith. Uh, Nathan the Wise by Lessing, the great German philosopher and writer um, and dramatist as well. Um, they should do this while recognizing that persons of different religious allegiance and practice might be capable of the same validation of their particular traditions. Because better understanding of others as well as better practice of one's own religious faith and one's own religious practice promotes at least three good outcomes, I think. First, increased acceptance or at least tolerance, if not acceptance or always you know, open-armed acceptance of the other because understanding itself is a good and liberating thing for each of us. Second, increased ability of the world's varied national and religious communities to work together to solve our urgent, common, global problems, such as hunger, health care, climate change, and degradation of our earthly habitat that we also share. Third, increased awareness of the historical fact that coercion in religious matters has invariably proved futile and worse. It has been the source of untold violence, mayhem, and misery throughout history as we can trace it. And here I'm reminded of the words of the Quran, which Muslim extremists today forget, in that there is no compulsion in religion. Religious understanding must be one important path to world peace, even if it is ever to be, if it is ever to be realized. I'm still optimistic enough, or some would say I'm sure naive enough, to believe that studying religion is important to any liberal education, which in turn should contribute to making our world better by making our citizenry better informed and wiser, more open to a diversity of views, heritages, allegiances, faiths, and religious as well as social and political systems. I firmly believe that religious literacy, like other kinds of literacy, is an important part of the knowledge and ethics toolbox of the liberally educated woman or man. And please note, I use the word liberal here in the sense of broad or open-minded, not to designate a political position. Arguably, there are, certainly there used to be maybe more, liberal-minded political conservatives as well as liberal-minded political liberals. Study of religion is not just for divinity schools and religion departments. We need the study of religion globally in every liberal arts general studies curriculum. In fact, we need it in every secondary school in America. I am convinced that we should study religion integrally within every school curriculum and every college curriculum in the 21st century because knowing about and understanding religion are critical elements in dealing with the world in which with every year, every human society and state is going to be growing more religiously and culturally pluralist in its makeup, not just our own society. It's going to be growing more in contact with differing worldviews and religious value systems and more dependent upon its peoples and those of other societies and states finding ways to live and to work together for the survival of our planet, let alone our species. I believe that we model this at Harvard Divinity School, but the model needs to be much more widely employed. In my remaining time, I want to move, though, beyond the why of my title to how one might study religion effectively. My own vision for the Divinity School has frankly not been that it should be a site for explicit interreligious dialogue as such. My experience of such dialogue efforts has too frequently been that they involve often either the juxtaposition of two monologues as each conversation partner tries to convince the other of his or her tradition's superiority. Here, I'm, I hope that's not coming from up there. <laughs> uh, or they involve a kind of uncritical refusal to recognize theological differences and historical traditions of conflict entirely, and to, they do that often in a rather soft-headed and soft-hearted effort to embrace one another and claim that at base all religions are the same, which is of course in my view as an historian nonsense. 
Instead, I've sought to sustain and augment this school as an intellectual meeting ground where persons of differing religious faith and tradition do not work on each other or each other's faith, but instead work together on what I like to call a tertium quid, some third thing, some problem or issue or topic about which both are passionate and concerned or by which both are simply intrigued. In working together shoulder to shoulder, as it were, in the seminar room, at study tables, or simply sitting over coffee here in Rock, um, some problem about which people are really passionate and concerned is really what you want people thinking about and working on. And I like to think that's what happens. Uh, I, I'd like to see people discovering values and ideas that they share with persons otherwise religiously and often culturally very different from themselves. Working side by side on common problems, persons of vastly differing faith and tradition and culture discover their shared humanity by recognizing the intelligence, the faithfulness, the morality, and the humanity of their compatriots, however different they may be. And ultimately, that is reason enough in itself for us to study religion in our schools and our institutions of higher learning. The global village is becoming a reality, and we can move into it either as per persons uh, ignorant and fearful of those neighbors different from ourselves, or we can move into it ready to work alongside very different kinds of people from every possible background towards the common good of a shared community. In the end, at times it is understanding and acceptance. At other times, it is at the very least tolerance or toleration that we are teaching by helping develop knowledge and critical understanding in studying religion. And it is crucial because we live in a world whereby and large you are not going to change the religious makeup except at the margins. One tradition may gain ground for a century, then lose for a century, and so on. But I cannot foresee a future that I, that I can imagine when one religious tradition is going to conquer the whole world. It is simply, I think, myopic, maybe even stupid, of any one group to think they are going to do that, if only because it is contrary to all historical experience for over 5,000 years at this point. The fact is, we need to learn to live with other different human beings, whatever their religious practices and beliefs may be. We cannot afford to focus on persons as part of a religious monolith that we type in a certain way, rather than as human beings who happen to have a religious allegiance that we could understand better if we listened to them. We cannot afford to do that above all in a shrinking world. And so the kind of education that I would like to think we are trying to offer here at HDS in our small way frankly needs to be propagated more widely in coming days. I hope that it will be. This is perhaps, again, a pious and naive hope on my part, but I don't think it is an unworthy one. Finally, it is perhaps the ultimate reason at any time for studying religion in all its forms, with all its failures, its faults, and its glories, over all its history, good and bad. Why study religion in the 21st century? Because it matters. If we were to adapt the first part of Reinhold Niebuhr's famous serenity prayer to bless our endeavor, I think it might go something like this, and I'd like to close with this. God, grant me the serenity to understand and accept the religious differences of which I may not approve, but which I cannot change. Courage to try to th change the things that may be changed and are worth changing, and wisdom to know the difference. It's that kind of wisdom that I would hope those who study religion, not least those here at Harvard Divinity School, are going to foster in the coming century. Thank you.